Hello, this is Salvatore Vinciguerra, and in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you the Oak Alley Plantation in Valchere, Louisiana. Please enjoy this video. The historic Oak Alley Plantation home is located on the west bank of the Mississippi River in southern Louisiana. The plantation home is named after the double row of southern live oak trees that have lined the property and been planted there in the early 18th century, long before the present house was built. The alley or tree avenue runs between the home and the Mississippi River. In my tour, I'm going to be sharing with you the slavery exhibit, which includes replicas of the homes the slaves lived in during the 18th century. Then I'll be sharing with you a little bit of the big house, but keep in mind that I'm not able to film video or take pictures inside of the big house. And since I can't share with you the inside of the big house, I can share with you these beautiful east and west gardens and share with you the historical significance of the Oak Alley Plantation Home. One of the things that I highly recommend that you do when you first visit the home, and maybe while you're waiting for the tour inside of the big house, is to take your time and walk this alley of oaks. Look up at the trees, walk to the Mississippi River, and then walk back, listen to the birds, and just sit there, maybe underneath a tree, and relax. Behind the big house is this row of shacks, or wooden homes, that the slaves lived in during the 18th century. Originally, these slave quarters consisted of 20 doubles, and a double is a single house split in two with one household living on each side. The exhibit only consists of six, but can you imagine the 20 lined up to the back of the rest of the property? As I give you a tour inside of some of the slave quarters, I want you to keep in mind how the slaves lived on the property and maybe what the duties were of some of these people and how they were treated by their slave owners. The slavery of African Americans has always been a touchy subject, but more especially when you visit these plantation homes. And a lot of these plantation homes have tried their best to educate the public on what slavery was in the United States. How slavery was a big part of the American culture, especially in the southern part of the United States, and even providing local slave history, which includes a list of the slaves that were on this property for family histories and so forth, as well as even talking about some of the slave revolts that happened in this area right before the Emancipation Proclamation. When Jacques and Selena Roman acquired the Oak Alley in 1836, it was a plantation whose primary residents were 57 field slaves. That same year, Jacques purchased 49 slaves from his mother's estate auction, bringing the total number of slaves to 106. Here are some of the expectations of life as a house slave. And you know, house slaves ran errands for the Romans. They served their dinner and they even watched their children. While less physically demanding than field work, a house slave's duties lasted well into the night, only ending when the Romans went to bed. They were issued better clothes and store-bought shoes since they reflected the Roman social status. They were to be neat and presentable at all times. Thank you. 
This is an example of a sick house on the plantation. And yes, the sugar plantations were very hazardous work environments for the slaves. They suffered from heat exhaustion and from the intensive labor of boiling sugar. And these compounded with the usual dangers of sanitation, abuse, and even malnutrition. Usually the slaves cared for their own sick, and in this case, Augustine and Tali were the plantation's enslaved sick nurses and responsible for the community's general care. With no formal training, these women relied on experience treating their fellow slaves with both African and Western medicine. If their own methods failed, or if there was an accident, they had to ask permission from the Romans to summon their doctor to help the slaves. Outside of these buildings, take note of some of the other items that you would find outside, like this water well, or even this laundry kettle, and try to imagine what the slaves would have done to, you know, take care of over a hundred people, either doing their laundry or even cooking for them in this outdoor environment. This is an example of an outdoor kitchen, and they would have had to have cooked uh, meals for about over a hundred people and also maybe even have had to have their own garden and they raised their own chickens. This is an example of what a chicken coop would have looked like and even some of these items if there was an abundance of them they could sell on the side to make some extra money. One of the essential things that I think helps this area come to life to help us understand a little bit more about the slaves that lived on this plantation is they have little plaques as you enter each one of the cabins. The plaque would then list the names of the slaves, maybe one or two of them, and describe what they would do on the plantation to help the Romans, uh, either with the crops or inside of the plantation home, and you know, just describe a little bit about how they lived here on the plantation. After the American Civil War, Oak Alley passed through a number of owners who used the quarters for worker housing. At first, they turned the doubles into single cabins. Later, they attached additions. Even as they were building, however, the original structures were steadily falling apart. Workers and their families continued to live in the crumbling houses until the turn of the century. Unsanitary and unsafe, they were demolished around 1900. As you can see, you can spend a couple of hours just in the slave exhibit that they have here at the Oak Alley Plantation. It is very educational. And I had to do this as I was just waiting to get into the main house. And uh, you know, you had to make a schedule, a particular time that you could tour that particular part of the house as they're only letting a certain amount of people go in at a time, especially during the COVID-19 period. And then after that, I went and explored the various gardens. And make sure that when you're visiting the house, that you take the opportunity to take your time. And uh, the, the grounds are absolutely beautiful. You can go and have lunch or bring your own lunch at some of the picnic tables that they have there and, and make the day out of just spending your time exploring this plantation. As you can see from the beginning or the introduction of this video, that I actually walked all the way up to the levee that goes to the Mississippi River and it gives you an even better perspective as to the location of a lot of these plantations along the river and the role that the Mississippi River played in helping to import and export some of these products all over either Louisiana or the nation or to other parts of the world. This particular part of the exhibit shares with you all of the names of the people that lived on the Oak Alley Plantation and were enslaved here. Mm -hmm. 
For those at Oak Alley, the end of slavery was not a single moment, but a series of events. After the end of the Civil War, they sought to build new lives in the economically and socially unstable environment of Reconstruction. Slavery first started to crumble at the onset of the Civil War, how slaves at Oak Alley ran away, an act known at this time as self-emancipation. While only a few years earlier they would have been caught and punished as fugitives, slaves could now disappear into the chaos surrounding New Orleans. Union General Benjamin Butler ordered slaves to return to their owners, stating that they were not free, but owners had to pay them. Most disregarded this order, and the question of free became subject to an interpretation. By the time Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, many former slaves already considered themselves freed men. Post-emancipation life varied from plantation to plantation, and for the first time freed men negotiated salaries and could demand overtime pay. However, many planters refused to pay their workers in currency. Planters instead built plantation stores and paid in store tokens. Those tokens had no value off the plantation, reducing many freedmen to varying degrees of bondage. Freedmen could not save, move, or better their lives anywhere else. Oak Alley's own store once stood between the Oaks and what is now known as the plantation entrance, and it was demolished around 1900. The slave quarters are located in the back of the plantation area and it's also accessible to the main parking lot which you can go and walk to your car or back to the bus if you needed to and that's what I decided to do. I walked back to my car, I got a drink of water. I could have brought my lunch but instead I forgot it that day. Can you believe it? I drove all the way from New Orleans, they have great food there and guess what? I forgot my lunch. So I went into this area over here. There is a restaurant. I didn't eat there. I didn't have time to eat lunch there because the line was so long but I decided to go into this building over here and it actually has a place where you can pick up a few sandwiches and some chips and there's a little gift store in there as well. After eating lunch, I then stood in line for my tour of the big house, which is what these plantation mansions are called. So again, I really can't share with you the inside of the big house, and that's because photography is prohibited, and you can understand why, and that's because they really want to preserve and have people take the tour to get a little bit more of the history about the house. I will say this about not only visiting this plantation home, but others in the area near New Orleans. A lot of the furnishings inside of the home are not original to the people that actually live there. And that's because these plantation homes have gone through many different stages, some of which have gone into disrepair and people have bought them and fixed them up and turned them into these wonderful historic places that people can tour to get an understanding of what happened here. For example, this particular plantation was first called the Bon Séjour Plantation, and the French Creole Valcour Ami purchased the land in 1830 to grow sugarcane. Ami, known as the King of Sugar, was one of the wealthiest men in the South. In 1836, Valcour Ami exchanged this piece of property with his brother-in-law, Jacques de la Four Roman, for a plantation home owned by Roman. The following year, slaves owned by Jacques Roman began building the present mansion under the oversight of George Sweeney. The mansion was completed in 1839, and Roman's father, Joseph Pelé, was an architect and probably designed the house. Antoine, the enslaved gardener of the Oak Alley Plantation, was a master of the technique of grafting, and after a trial with several trees, succeeded in the winter of 1846 in producing a variety of pecan that would be cracked with one's bare hands. The shell was so thin that it was dubbed the paper shell pecan. It was later named the Centennial variety when entered in the competition at the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia where it won a prize. The trees may be found throughout southern Louisiana where the pecan was once considered a cash crop. Although Antoine's original trees were cleared for more sugarcane fields after the Civil War, a commercial grove has been planted nearby the Nita Plantation. 
Unfortunately, the Nita Crevasse break of 1890 washed away the Nita plantation and all the remains of the original Centennial pecans. Jacques Roman died in 1848 of tuberculosis, and the estate began to be managed by his wife, Marie Therese Josephine Selina Pillay Roman. Selina did not have a skill for managing a sugar plantation, and her heavy spending nearly bankrupt the estate. In 1859, her son Henry took control of the estate and tried to turn things around. The plantation was not physically damaged during the American Civil War, but the economic dislocations of the war and the end of slavery made it no longer economically viable. Henry became severely in debt, mainly to his family. In 1866, his uncle, Bakor Ami, and his sisters, Octavia and Louise, put the plantation up for auction and it was sold for $32,800 to John Armstrong. Successive owners could not afford the cost of the upkeep and by the 1920s the building had fallen into disrepair. In 1925 the property was acquired by Andrew Stewart as a gift to his wife Josephine who commissioned architect Richard Koch to supervise the extensive restoration and modernize the house. As a virus had wiped out the sugarcane industry in the early 1900s, the Stewarts ran Oak Alley Plantation as a cattle ranch. Josephine had grown up on a cattle ranch in Texas and was familiar with this type of industry. Sugarcane cultivation was reintroduced at the plantation in the 1960s. The Stewarts were the last owners to live in the residence and Josephine Stewart left the historic house and grounds to the Oak Alley Foundation when she died in 1972 which opened the grounds and the house up to the public. After visiting the big house and visiting all of the beautiful gardens that they have on the grounds, don't forget to check out some of these hidden exhibits that they have at the plantation. This exhibit focused on the production of sugar from the sugar cane and it goes not only from the history of the production in southern Louisiana at that time, the video also shares with you what this modern industry looks like today and the science that goes into making the sugar. Now let me go back to the East Garden. The East Garden is an interpretation of early 20th century garden design trends that responded to an increasing interest in America's past, particularly its garden heritage. In 1925, Josephine Stewart came to Oak Alley and established a garden that would evolve over her lifetime. It reflected horticultural trends and popular culture, from informal historic romanticism to restrained boxwood hedges, and always included her favorites, azaleas, roses, and camellias. Today, the East Garden features these plants in addition to those that grow well here and were common in regional gardens. Flower colors respond to Oak Alley's soft pink facade, a color suggestion made in the late 1920s by the Stewart's architect, Richard Koch of New Orleans. In the 1920s to 1930s, Josephine embraced the interest in historic revivalism wholeheartedly in the early years of her residency at Oak Alley. She filled her garden with mixed annuals and perennials and showcased her favorite roses. The result was an unstructured garden bursting with colors and textures. From the 1940s to the 1970s, Josephine's garden became more deliberate and structured as she relied increasingly on her gardeners. Boxwood hedges replaced annuals and perennials and organized the space into simple rectangular beds with rose plantings and magnolia accents. Over the time, these changes defined a garden room that created a sense of enclosure for Oak Alley's east facade. However simplified Josephine's gardens became, she was by no means a minimalist. Even as she became more selective with her plant choices and her garden became more structured, she maintained her interest in the romantic and disorderly Roses Abounded. Tremendous wisteria vines draped Oak Alley's columns and she encouraged ivy to grow on the galleries as well. By Josephine Stewart's death in the early 1970s, the roses had gone. Slowly, the garden's low boxwood hedges became tall green walls. By the end of the 20th century, what was once a flower garden with trim borders had become a maze-like space. The current garden, inspired by the spirit of Mrs. Stewart's interest in the gardens, 
returns to an earlier style and honors her stewardship of this cultural landscape. Don't forget to check out the description box below in this video as it has the website for the Oak Alley Plantation. Valcher is about an hour or so away from New Orleans, Louisiana, so you can drive from New Orleans and back in one day if you're staying in the city. However, if you want to stay in Valcher, they do have overnight cottages at the Oak Alley Plantation. The only food or dining in this area could be the Oak Alley Plantation itself in the back where I shared with you where I had a sandwich. However, they do have special brunches on the weekend and maybe different events throughout the year. So check out their website. If you'd like to have a wedding at the Oak Alley Plantation, they also do have some ballrooms in that area in the back of the facility as well. A couple other plantations you can visit in the area are are the Whitney Plantation, which is quite nearby the Oak Alley Plantation, the Laura Plantation, and you cannot leave New Orleans without visiting the famous Destrehan Plantation. This is the levee across from the Oak Alley Plantation, and you're looking at the Mississippi River. These levees were not always here and were built in the early 1700s around New Orleans and the Mississippi River, and that's because a lot of these areas flooded very easily. So it protected a lot of the farms and plantations from the water as they were rising that could actually swell up in the summertime during the rainy season or during a hurricane. Hopefully this video gives you a better understanding of the Mississippi River and its location to the Oak Alley Plantation, as over 2,000 plantations once existed along the Mississippi River up to New Orleans, and only 100 remain in existence, and 20 are open to the public.
This is Salvatore Vinci Guerra. Thank you for watching this video on the Oak Alley Plantation in Valcher, Louisiana. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to this channel, and have a great day. Thank you.